Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Juliette Bramwell, and I lead telco, media, and entertainment for Google Cloud in the UK. I'm delighted to be here in sunny San Francisco, and I'm really delighted to work in this industry, which I think is the best industry in the world. And there's many reasons for that. The fame, the fortune, the glamour. Um, and I can't imagine anywhere else where you could create Barbenheimer, the global phenomenon of Barbie and Oppenheimer. So I'm gonna spend the next five minutes setting the scene just giving a view of what we're seeing in the market and how Google Cloud is helping to transform your businesses. So it's no surprise that streaming is booming. How many streaming apps do you think there are globally? I'm gonna ask for a bit of audience participation here. 50? Actually, I'm gonna give a prize. Whoever gets it gets this. Limited edition Google Cloud Pad. <laughs> What's that? 51. Higher, higher. 100? No. Who said 200? There's over 200 in the world. There you go. I, I promise he wasn't a plant. There you go. <laughs> um, how many households, or how many subscriptions do you have in your household? If you have more than four, put your hand up. Wow. You're perfectly normal. The average household has four or more subscriptions. And with that comes a lot of expense, but a lot of power. So you have the power to switch, which means media companies have to spend billions of dollars creating content to keep you. A really good example is Ted Lasso. So in the UK, um, I haven't got the stats, but I know a lot of people subscribe to Apple TV just to watch Ted Lasso. It's actually filmed in my hometown of Richmond. So if you come to London, let me know. I'll give you a personal tour, Ted Lasso tour, free. Um, but yes, streaming is here to stay. And we're seeing just fantastically lots of pressure consumer expectations, wanting more personalization, more recommendations, more interaction. This combined with the macroeconomic conditions, cost of living crisis, right to strike, you know, all of this is coming together to put a lot of pressure on media companies. And marketing have got multiple platforms now to try and attract and retain customers. So with that complexity, this is where technology can really affect the business outcomes. And if you can provide personalization in real time, we can see a 50% increase in customer loyalty. It's very powerful. Our mission at Google Cloud is to help media companies on your transformation journey to, Im to improve your audience experiences through innovation and Gen, I. Gen, a Gen AI. I've been told I get a nickel every time I mention Gen AI. Um, so there's lots of areas of focus for investment. And there's three areas of innovation that we see ourselves play. One is creation, so content creation. One is distribution, how to distribute content to relevant audiences. And the other is engagement, how to engage the audience and get more monetization. A good example, top of mind, is TikTok. So two years ago, it was a billion dollar company, now it's nearly 10 billion. The subscribers, the average subscriber spends one and a half hours a day scrolling through short form video, which is just phenomenal. And so we wanna work with innovative companies, you see some here, I've got some that I'm gonna to introduce to you in a moment, where we can really help accelerate that journey to transformation. There's four main solution pillars we look at to future-proof and innovate in your business. The first one is around increasing content production. Deli the next one, delivering cloud-enabled live broadcast experiences, then streaming transformation, and then creating more value with data and AI. And we see some really top use cases coming out of those. So, some examples here, but these are the ones that we've been working with in your industry to either save costs, 
increase enablement, increase revenue streams. So anything from the um, VFX rendering to production in the cloud to um, multi-cloud, I can't read that one, multi-cloud management, and then also, of course, data and AI and the recommendation AI packs supercharging the personalization journey. So the nickel slide, that's Gen AI. How can we work with you to accelerate so perhaps things that you're doing already using Gen AI, whether it be in content creation, in the personalization of audience experiences, or improving monetization and getting more revenue streams to hit on all those challenges that I talked about at the beginning. So I think this is the perfect moment to introduce my guests. Um, we've got two fantastic real-life clients, Paramount and Fox Sports, who are going to talk with Anil about their journey using Gen AI and the cloud. Thank you. It's a good crowd. They're here for you. I can feel the energy. It's not quite Taylor Swift crowd. No, not quite. Anyway, good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. Um, so my name is Anil Jain. I lead our strategic consumer industries at Google Cloud um, now, which uh, spans media and entertainment, games, retail, and CPG. Happy to talk to you about all of those. But we're here for media and entertainment, which I spent the bulk of my time at Google Cloud uh, building up. Uh, with my great colleagues here in the audience and with a number of you in the audience as well. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of having these two gentlemen both as colleagues and friends. Uh, and so we're going to just dive right into a conversation. Um, we do have a mic here. So after we go through a little bit of um, uh, dialogue, uh, sharing insights on and perspectives on the applications of AI and media and entertainment now and in the future, uh, we're happy to open it up to questions, um, and then we always have plenty to talk about, so even if you don't have questions, we'll keep going. So maybe what we can do is, Phil, um, if you would start off and then go to Dustin, just introduce yourself, um, your role, responsibility, company, and then uh, maybe spend a little bit of time on areas of AI application in your business right now, and that way we sure. kick it off and we can dive into questions afterwards. Great, yeah. Um, again, hi everybody, I'm Phil Weiser. I, I run technology and operations at Paramount, which is a collection of, of media assets and brands you would recognize like CBS. Um, clearly we've got Paramount Pictures um, and our Paramount Plus and Pluto streaming services, Showtime, and then a, a large um, collection of brands like MTV, Comedy Central, and then many recognizable brands on the franchise level. SpongeBob being one of my favorites, and Yellowstone obviously being in the zeitgeist of, of popular culture right now. Um, and we, we brought all these companies together really about four years ago. Um, what was initially Viacom CBS when we merged them and then rebranded that all to be Paramount. And uh, we work across the traditional businesses and the streaming businesses to create you know, a technology and operational ecosystem that can scale up to deliver these experiences, whether it's going through a traditional provider or going through one of our streaming platforms or somebody else's streaming platforms, um, as we're all you know, continuing to diversify our business. So it's really an interesting dynamic in the industry right now where we were focused on hyper growth of streaming, and now we're really focused on continued growth of streaming, but also you know, getting the economics of the business right-sized, really around production, which is where we spend the bulk of our money, production of content and marketing. Um, so we're looking at that, and then AI is something we've had in our culture for quite a long time. We had an applied machine learning group um, back at CBS, actually, at CBS Interactive, um, probably in the 2016 time frame. And that group um, has built all the recommendation systems that go into Paramount Plus and increasingly into other services like Pluto. Um, but we have also, in, in what I was jokingly referring to as OG AI, yeah, um, right. you know, the 2017 era AI where you could go in and do object recognition and things like that. And I saw the demo, congrats on the keynote of Fox Sports, but just pulling images out so we could identify those for things like editing um, and then you know, identifying new assets that we want 
want to get, get at, but we're using that also to create um, snippets or summaries. So when you mouse over an asset in the UI of Paramount Plus, that 15 or 30 second reel is generated by machine learning. Uh, with a human in the loop, obviously, to make sure it represents what we want. But we've been applying that. And now as we get into Gen AI, which will be the interesting topic today, we can take all of that to the next level, particularly around production. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, this is about AI in media entertainment. So it could be OG AI or Gen AI, because I think, honestly, uh, the applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning in driving transformation in media and entertainment is, are quite significant and varied, so feel free to touch upon any sure. and all of it. Dustin? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Dustin Myers. Um, I run production operations for Fox Sports. We are the home of um, the NFL, the World Series, and the, the FIFA World Cup. And uh, I focus a lot on using AI for content production. Um, those of you who saw our keynote yesterday, you saw what the great job you guys did showing off what we call the Intelligent Asset Service, which is the IS. Um, it has taken our entire library, dumped in basically 27, 28 years of Fox Sports, and it's basically what we affectionately call Fox YouTube. So we can find more or less anything we want in there, and it enhances our group. So where we're at now, though, is we're looking at, well, what's next, right? So it's, it's AI, and, and we've used OG AI as well, right? You know, we trained models on what's a touchdown, what's a home run, where are all these different components, and it's, it's enabled us to find our media. If you're a storyteller, that's, that's it, right? It's the ingredients of finding the right shot, finding the right clip, finding the right emotion that you need to tell your story. But we're trying to take it to another place now. We're trying to take it to how do we enhance our creatives? How do we give them the tools across the globe to tell stories differently? And I think that's where, that's where Gen AI comes in, is where we're trying to create, not replace people, but create a, a collaboration partner for production, that you now have tool sets that will do the first few steps for you or get you down the creative path um, in a way that you haven't before. Awesome, thank you both for being here, appreciate it. Sure. By the way, how many of you watched the keynote yesterday and saw the Fox Sports demo? That's something that, that we spent a long time working on and we're pretty proud of, so I'm happy to see how many Good. people saw that. Um, you know, Juliet put up a, a slide earlier that um, identified, you know, what I like to refer to as kind of the three lenses, you know, of how you look at the applications of, of generative AI. Um, but the truth is, those are the same lenses you would use for traditional, you know, uh, existing AI and machine learning as well that was pre-generative. Um, because fundamentally, the application of generative AI also has to still conform to driving the same KPIs that a, a business and media and entertainment company needs to uh, needs to care about. So just as a reminder, those were, you know, content creation, production, and management, right, which is what both of you have, have uh, spoken about, um, enabling more engaging and personalized experiences, because I think, you know, the North Star in many cases for media and entertainment is about increasingly hyper-personalization of experiences, uh, and we can talk about generative AI. We can, can debate there. that one, because I think people have gone a little off the rails on that, but that'll be fine. Okay, we'll be happy. Actually, debate would be great. Um, and then third, of course, is increasing, enhancing monetization. So let's start first in the production area because you both have, have touched upon that. So Justin, can you spend a little more time detailing what exactly happens? Well, how about, how about we do it this way? Talk about the before state and then the current state. And if you could uh, maybe underscore why that's important in terms of value for the business, because ultimately we can all work on incredible science and technology projects, but they have to affect the business in a way uh, that creates value, at least value that is understood and perceived, regardless of whether it's quantifiable or not. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a good point you make. I mean, we started off with an attitude of, well, let's change how people work. Yeah. We had an antiquated system, and, and I'll take you through it because someone will laugh. Yeah. Um, if you worked at Fox Sports, you know, in, in you know, 2010, and, and you were trying to do a piece, let's, let's pick World Cup, you want to do a, a, a story on Messi, and you wanted to find material for him, well, you would, you know, you could go into our existing MAM and you could try to find it and you'd get about, you know, thousands of clips that were name, date, and some other long titles and you wouldn't know what it was. And then you'd go to YouTube and you'd find out what you were looking for and then you'd get the key date. And then you'd go back to the MAM and eventually you'd find it. It'd yeah. take a while though. Um, and so what we did is we went out into the, into the marketplace and we went to NAB like anyone else and we talked to everyone there. 
there was like 33 companies, my team's over here, and I know they're laughing about this. But um, we talked to everyone we could, and, and no one could do it, so we went to Google, and you guys said, sure, let's try this. And, and why that's important is, look, when you make a, a you know, feature film like these guys do, or you do pregame shows like we do, or any kind of content, you don't ever really finish. You, you run out of time and you run out of money, right? right. Yeah. And what enabled us is now that we've taken the whole library, put it in, run the machine learning on it, use speech to text, use all the associative things. You can search for a person and a person and it comes up. You know, for our ad sales team, you can search for you know, a truck and a talent and it comes up, which is all wonderfully useful. But what it's really done, the value in it is, it has, it has made that the finding of material, which was a huge hurdle for us, it's more or less taken it away. Yeah. And hats off to our team who, who've done this. So you, you've taken processes that were two days, two weeks, to two hours, two minutes. And the value in that is it, it's changed how we work. You no longer sit back and say, well, we, uh, we don't have enough time to do that, because you, you can. And I think it, it's, it's changed our business in, in a way that we didn't see coming. We knew it would be good. We knew it would, you know, it would affect the supply chain to an extent. But what we didn't see is that it would affect the company, that now the marketing group can come in and they have access to our content. Executives, no matter where they are in the world, can, can access our content. And we can all collaborate on that content because of what we've done. Yeah. Amazing. You know, just uh, something you said um, a couple times in there is about uh, changing the way you work. And, you know, obviously you, you can't walk around Google Cloud Next or talk to anybody in cloud and not talk about the word transformation, right? And so fundamentally, when you think about business transformation or digital transformation, um, the definition I like best is really about reimagining the way you work, right? The way the business operates. And so this is a classic example of exactly that. Right, where you're changing the way in which many functions within the business operate. And um, we'll talk a little bit about where you think that can go. I was going to just yeah. build on something yeah. Dustin said, because I think it's really important. Um, what you didn't know was going to come out of the process, right? right? And we talk about emergent properties of these systems. Maybe we call these emergent outcomes. But right. you really, I think, you know, to getting momentum within the company around this, you have to develop a belief system that this is really good. And we know that really good things are going to happen. We're not going to go in and analyze exactly how many hours of someone's day is going to be saved by doing it, because yeah. it's really kind of a waste of time. Um, but you need to go in and understand like it's not a science experiment. It gets to the core of people doing work. Um, and that's what we're trying to do you know, across Paramount now, is just get the tools in the hands of the people that are doing this work, and then observe what comes out of it. And I think that's, that's really important, because I see a lot of people get hung up on digging into specific use cases, going really deep on analysis, and the market's going to move past them yeah. while we're deploying these tools. You know, I'm going to diverge from the direction we were going just because of something you said, Phil. So it uh, would be really, I think, useful for not just this crowd, but pretty much anybody who's in this, uh, who's at the conference today, something you said uh, right there is getting, um, moving forward without having the precision or the uh, expected precision of what the outcome is going to be, right? Because there will be emergent outcomes. There are things, it's like when I, uh, I was speaking to a, a reporter yesterday and they asked, you know, where, what would be your one piece of advice to a company that hasn't started their cloud journey on where to start? I said, you start with the data, right? Mm -hmm. But in, uh, because you don't know what's going to come of it until you've actually started to organize and collect it. You have a lot of ideas, but you don't really know until you do it. So. In that type of scenario, we're all technologists here running, you know, functional, you know, uh, various functions of businesses uh, throughout our careers. How do you convince the CFO that you need to make these investments when there isn't a clear um, value equation or assessment or economic model or ROI that can be calculated? I don't always convince them, and I think that's really <laughs> important. But, but, but. We'll, we'll move ahead with it because we know that the outcome's gonna be there. But in all seriousness, like we go in with some of these and really try and identify small bets that we can make without needing that level of precision in the output to say, look, it's a relatively small bet. We're gonna do this and then we're gonna learn and then just like a good venture capitalist, we'll increase the next round when we see the results in the previous round. And we try to do that in all of our investments. But for the bigger ones, let's say we wanna take our whole archive right. and convert that, which is not a trivial effort, it's pretty straightforward to put rough numbers in there and identify pain points. 
um, and just you know, looking historically at things we've already done with right. previous transformations. And I referenced the cloud quite a bit because it's a great parallel. We had the same exact conversation, replace AI with cloud. Yeah. How do you convince your CFO that moving to the cloud is going to be right. better? And you know, we know what happened to companies that spent three years you know, wringing their hands trying to analyze every potential outcome. They got left behind and ended up doing another spin of a capital investment depreciation cycle while the rest of us were running uh, and operating that way. The other thing I do, and getting away from just the financial analysis, is also looking at it through the lens of a startup. Mm -hmm. If I was going into the business today as a startup and wanted to operate this, how would I do it? Would I hire a bunch of people to go in and tag those images or scenes, or would I be applying AI? Obviously, you know, you'd be applying AI and we've everything in the cloud. So I think that kind of mentality, saying, well, how would I do it today to be competitive with someone that's gonna eat my lunch coming into the market, is somewhat convincing from a fear perspective. It's very effective. Um, but I do, th you know, I think I'm not downplaying an analytics. I obsess over dollars every yeah. day. Yeah. But I think you just have to balance that out with strategy. I think, though, it's, it's back to your point of if, if you started your journey here, I think there's a few things we learned is try to create an environment where people are not afraid to fail. It's not, because I, I think this is, a, this is a shift. This is not about, like, look, we put in, we start using AI and we're gonna, you know, these assistants are gonna save three hours a day. I think it's, that's, that's the wrong way to look at it. You're investing in people and saying, we're gonna take the mundane tasks and maybe take them off your hands. Mm -hmm. And we're also gonna take tasks that you can't do and see if we can help you do them. And then you're gonna focus on the human work in the middle and you're gonna get better and better. And, us as a brand will get better because of that collective effort. I, I don't think it's this traditional ROI model. To your point, like there's a certain amount of like we can go down this path of the of the depreciative investment, or we can try to go this way and invest in our people and our brand. Well, building on that too, it's important to go after where you spend most of your money, which is why when yeah. we were looking at it, Paramount we said focus on production. That's where we spend the largest amount of capital every year creating content. And we know there's a lot of painful <laughs> processes involved and inefficient processes involved in the billions of dollars that we put into that content. So when you enter in like, hey, if we get you know, a, a incremental improvement against that very large number, obviously it's worth making a, a relatively small investment. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of Thank you both for sharing that. Phil, in, in Paramount, um, focusing on production, which obviously, you know, tremendous um, span of, of work that gets done in Paramount to serve kind of multiple endpoints, if you will, in distribution channels. Um, where do you think the greatest opportunities lie to leverage AI in the production pipeline? And, and by the way, is it pre-production? How much time do we have? <laughs> well, let's, let's start with what works today. I mean, you know, we know that transfer learning or deep fakes work. So we look at those things we know work today really well and figure out where that hits our production pipeline. Clearly, dubbing and subbing, mm. uh, where you're trying to take the tone or style of an original voice and have that go into a different language is a great application. So a lot of people in the industry are looking at globalization. Um, as an opportunity. And globalization is not just dubbing and subbing, it's also different edits for different markets based on standards or cultural issues, um, which takes a lot of time. So that's, I think, a quick win that everybody's looking at right now. The mundane editing work, like yeah. going in and, and doing image correction or creating objects or replacing objects or changing style, those are all things that the technology does really well right now. So I think that's huge. Where I think a lot of people have gotten you know, off course is this green field video generation where AI is gonna generate yeah. a new episode or a new feature film. Anyone that's played around with it knows that you get three or so seconds of video and then a bunch of people stitch those three seconds together and you get a video that kind of looks like most of the other AI generated videos. Very janky. For the, yeah. Most, yeah. For the most part, like it's gonna get there. Yeah. But I think that being pragmatic about what works today and then applying that to the business, that's what I'm most energized about. And we've got examples, like you said, we have um, the Late Show with Colbert, one of our editors had to do a quick turn because they do the day of news. They get together in the early afternoon, generate ideas, and then, hey, there's a bit. We're going to have a three-minute episode. And the editors furiously go and try and get it done in six hours, and sometimes they're like, I just can't do that in time. And we had one example where we just had to place this Ben and Jerry's ice cream character in a bunch of funny scenes, which normally was a lot of linear editing work that took five to six hours. This editor did it in 10 minutes. 
um, with an yeah. off-the-shelf tool. So those kind of proof points are where you, you yeah. win the hearts and minds of the people that are in the creative community. I think it's really, as you had said, Dustin, important to always tack back to the creative community and what they're really going to embrace, what's going to make their life better. Awesome. Dustin, you've spent all this time, you and the team, and, and, and we know it well, in the trenches, making you know, this, this beautiful solution work with starting with 27 petabytes of content and tens of thousands of hours of, of footage every month to do exactly what you explained earlier. And you also do a lot of collaboration across Fox Sports on Workspace, mm -hmm. and, you know, which of course, a lot of announcements this week as well on that. If you look at kind of the starting point as the intelligent asset service, which it fundamentally allows you know, AI and, and ML-based search um, and workspace. Where do you see, um, uh, this is kind of a, a loaded question because I know you have a very long roadmap, um, but where do you see um, future opportunities that are really exciting to apply generative AI on top of the work you guys have already done? I mean, I think, I think for me, and, and, and it's things that you know, we kick around in the, the art of what's possible, but we're here and we're talking about yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Um, I'd like to train the model. I would like to get models that we that know what's funny, know hmm. what's sad, and I'd like to start, start like take it from an interview, and run a model on it and have it parse out the parts of the interview that match a criteria. I'd love you know to have our producers write a script, and analyze it for what and score a song to match it, you know, and to really create something from the data we already have. Because like you think about it, when you have your in, your entire library, more or less, right. there. Why can't you take, and you said workspaces, like why can you start to point, instead of the royalty-free library that Slides uses, point it at your library. Right. And as your marketing teams are looking to create materials, and instead of, you know, oh, I need a shot at it, create it. Yeah. Or, or pull from your library to enhance it and start learning your style for your company. I mean, look, what, what is the UI of the IaaS? It's just a portal into our library. What's work, Workspaces was described earlier today as a, as a portal into Gen AI, for, or Duet, basically. Right. That's all these should be, is portals into something. So maybe we start combining those abilities, and your content can just be the building blocks, and AI is the tool to help you get to places you couldn't go before. I was just going to build on that, actually, because okay. I do think what you hit on you know, is a challenge for all media companies with a scale of libraries. You know, how are we going to build our models that are proprietary? Yes. And, yeah. and really take advantage of those, get higher fidelity outputs based on our existing IP to generate new IP. And we're all trying to figure that out. Like, do we go with you know, off-the-shelf existing models and fine-tune them? Do we build net new models? I mean, that, that, to me, is going to be a really interesting evolution over the next couple of years to figure out what's the right... Yeah. Architecture, and then you know, how are we going to you know turn that into a usable tool within the company? Yeah, I, I mean, I we literally this morning had a conversation with a number of media and gaming executives, um, and some consumer uh, companies as well about this very topic, um, and I think that you know there is no silver bullet here, right? There's a lot of experimentation and exploration that has to happen, and you know this is also fundamentally why we. You know, you'll often hear me say we don't believe in one model to rule them all, right? There's a whole range of models that can be utilized, um, you know, fit for purpose um, based on performance, accuracy, um, proprietary data, and then the ability, of course, to train your own models, right, based on the rights that you have, whether you own the assets or not. Of course, the agreements with, you know, uh, licensors will also change accordingly. Um, so I, before we go into questions, because I'm sure we have a few, um, uh, just a couple more real quick. Uh, you touched upon something that I was going to ask you, and you, you said it earlier. Part of, um, part of the, the worlds that you guys live in, right, because you're in very large, established, top 10, vertically integrated media companies that have you know, production through distribution, right? Um, you know, linear as well as live, as well as digital, and more, right? Um, and uh, part of what the capabilities that have just been announced you know, in this last year with generative AI, part of what they enable is this democratization of, you know, of content generation as well as um, the availability of capabilities that you know 
most small companies or individuals could not previously access, right? That's the dream in many cases. What is the attitude you have at Fox, maybe, and then we'll go to Paramount, on um, the landscape and whether there are going to be um, startups and other companies that come in and move faster and uh, provide you know, competitive alternatives to what it is you're doing? I mean, I think it's difficult in sports to have a newcomer come. In technology, yes. Mm -hmm. But in sports, is governed by rights. Mm -hmm. So I think that what you could see is people start to carve off tools that can be used by people like Phil and I. Mm -hmm. And then over time, they gain share. And then eventually, they get to a point where maybe they're offering something that we're not. Okay. But I think as far as the content generation, I mean, what we're doing is we're telling stories based on sports because we have the rights to them. Yeah, right. I do think that there are plenty of opportunities, though, for startups to partner with us and to create something that we've never thought of and to change the audience, what the audience gets at home. Right. There are, there's someone here who will come up with something we don't do. Right. And we will go, oh, we need that. Yeah. Or our audience decides they want that. Right. And I think, I don't know what it is, but it, it, I think that's what will happen. Interesting. Well, I would just open with saying there's no more powerful force in media and entertainment than FOMO. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody has FOMO right now right, because sure. this has been so hyped yeah. up, which is a great thing for a big company because now instead of pushing change and transformation, we've got people pushing on us to enable them oh, yeah. to use the tools. So I think that bodes well for people being curious, but I do think if you look at some of the really amazing creators that are using these tools today, they are you know, a year or more ahead of anyone um, generally within our company in terms of you know, sophistication of manipulating the models, sure. you know, the, what they're doing with prompting and, um, and queuing things up. Um, so I do think it's gonna, you know, it's gonna have to be a combination of us looking at those creators, hopefully bringing them in and working with them on new ideas and productions but I don't think it's gonna fundamentally shift the landscape of, of the ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it really is another big technology trend. We've seen many of them before. Is, you know, we don't have people in rooms cutting film anymore and that right. didn't sure. shift the dynamic of the industry. So we'll, there'll be a disruption, but I think it will settle out. I just hope there's you know, a larger volume of high quality content that comes out of it because it should be generally cheaper to produce and take some of the non-creative costs out of the creative output. Yeah. And if we can, can accomplish that, I think it's going to be good for creators. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I, I do want to highlight that I think one thing that's a commonality uh, between what both of you said is it comes down to when you say rights or you say the, the content depth, like it's intellectual property, right? And you guys both have a very strong base there. The thing that I do think about a lot is new forms of entertainment. Yeah. Right, that emerge, um, and generative AI potentially plays a role in, in making that happen. And are, are you exploring um, ways of engaging audiences and delivering compelling storytelling, Phil, that go outside of, you know, the video plays when I press play? Well, this is this gets back to the debatable point. Uh, yes, yeah. because everybody logically goes to hyper-personalized content created on the fly for an individual based on their interests. Right. I'm really skeptical of that. Sure. Having just seen the challenges of that sort of, you know, customized content outside of really great marketing. Yeah. Um, but I do think that there's a great opportunity in content discovery mm -hmm. where, you know, we're still searching, we're still clicking and browsing on tiles of things. Yeah. Um, and that feels very archaic in a modern world. So I don't know if, you know, there's a new user navigation experience that's much more intelligent that you know is kind of a companion yeah. you know maybe clippy for those that remember clippy oh my God. clippy comes to life finally you know, 30 years later i don't think we're allowed to say clippy at a google conference but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> just joking. well it's, yeah, it's, it's a negative so yeah we're good. yeah we're good. it's okay <laughs> you think that content discovery will get much more yeah. interesting because you know as dustin said you're not going in and manually tagging things and organizing them, you know, it will auto-organize yeah. um, in a different way. So I do think there's some opportunity there. Just, just if I can add, I think there's an interesting point, though, where we'll see another generation of storytellers and technologists who grew up, for lack of a better term, with the technologies that we're putting. So they never dug around for footage. They right. never looked at tapes. Right. They started with something that offers it up to them. Oh, they started digital. Right. And, and I think that there's something to be said. Out of that process and that learning, will you you may get an evolution or you may get to a place we haven't gotten yet. Yeah. And, and I think we've seen that in some of the fast services. Obviously, we're very right. proud of, of Pluto and what they've done pioneering that space. 
before those services came on, nobody would have really thought hey, a pseudo linear experience right, yeah. where it feels like an old channel guide, but it's personalized through yeah. viewing. Like those are things that are kind of emergent, you know, businesses sure. that are really super interesting. So I think you're right. Like we have to learn from, you know, Reels and TikTok and others in terms of that auto feed push type of experience and see how it plays with longer form content. Nobody solved that one yet. Yeah. So it's an interesting one. So with that, thank you both gentlemen. I applaud the work you've done. Thank you.